Greetings and welcome to a very special episode. Last summer, Konami announced that they would be entering into the highly saturated retro mini console market with their own tiny versions of the PC Engine, Core Graphics, and of course, the TurboGrafx-16. Just as with all other retro mini consoles, the basic idea is to allow older, casual gamers to re-experience some of the very best video games of their youth. By producing tiny HDMI-ready replicas of old-school video game consoles that are pre-loaded with a bunch of classic games. For gamers who aren't avid collectors of original hardware, or massive and rapidly aging CRT monitors, or for gamers who either morally oppose or lack interest in emulation and ROM downloading, these little retro consoles offer an easy way to relive the greatest moments of their neglected, sedentary childhoods. You just take the little guy out of the box, plug it into your HDMI ready flat screen TV, grab your controller and play your games, at least the games it came with, until of course someone figures out how to hack it. The Nintendo and Super Nintendo Classic versions of this concept were so popular that they broke Christmas. Twice. But successors and even a lot of the predecessors have released these things to varying degrees of lesser success. So how does the new TurboGrafx-16 Mini stack up with the competition? Is this going to be another gem like the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis Classic? Or is this a bad case of the PlayStation Minis? Find out on this most important episode of Creative Cat Productions, the Turbo Graphics Mini. Wait, 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 what are you talking about, dude? The Turbo Graphics Mini was delayed until December 31st, 2020, due to la corona. You can't review a thing that don't exist, man. Ah, but we got one of these from Amazon Japan. You see, as of making this video, it's entirely possible to order one of these, have it shipped to the US with no problem. As soon as they became available on Amazon Japan, I went ahead and canceled our pre-order with Amazon USA and it was here in about a week. Dang, man, that must have cost a lot. Yes, but not that much more. You see, at $100, the TurboGrafx-16 Mini is already one of the most expensive retro mini consoles ever made. But I actually ended up paying $110 to have this thing imported from Japan. So, it was more expensive, but not that much more expensive. Whoa! <laughs> kids. Speaking about kids, let's talk about this wacky box. This packaging is very high quality, but sadly, you don't get the middle-aged version of that overly excited 90s kid from the original TurboGrafx-16 box. That was a missed opportunity. However, you do get this really funny homage to early 90s youth fashion, with this shot of these shoes. If you ever wanted to know what kind of footwear that overexcited boy was wearing, well, now you know. He's wearing Converse. Let's take a look inside. Holy moly, is this thing huge! There is nothing mini about this mini console. It's perfect. Just as the TurboGrafx-16 was an unnecessarily giant monster, so too is this. And I kinda like it like that. As a point of comparison, Here's the TurboGrafx Mini compared to the Sega Genesis Mini. Now here is the TurboGrafx Mini compared to a howitzer tank. And that's just about right, as far as I'm concerned. Despite its size, it's actually very lightweight, and it feels very sturdy. Just as with the PC Engine Mini, you have a functional switch to lock in the non-existent hue card. All the little details are here. Get this, in order to plug in the HDMI cable and USB power cable, you have to gently pull the back off just as you could with the original Turbo Graphics when getting it ready to mate with the Turbo CD. However, I found these tabs holding in the power cable to be annoyingly tight. I had to work the cable back out and I unintentionally damaged the cord a little bit. It's just cosmetic, but I'm mad at these tabs. Bad tabs. Bad, bad, bad tabs. Overall though, the look and build of this thing is very solid. I love it. A lot of people have expressed difficulty with pulling the back off, and it's not too clear from the manual. So I made a short video a few days ago showing an easy method for removing the back. Here's a refresher. It's just like that. Here's the controller, and it's solid. They must have really put a lot of effort into ensuring the quality of this because it feels great. And that probably also helps explain why this thing is $25 on Amazon. It's also got a super long cord too in case you like to play in the next room. And it really looks like the real thing. I love the controller. It's responsive. It's sturdy, it feels good. Some people have described it as being a little bit stiff, but I think that once you break it in, it'll be perfect. 
The best part though are the turbo switches, which are essentially nothing more than basic rapid fire switches that make the CPU believe you can press the action button faster than what is humanly possible. The PC Engine Mini doesn't come with turbo switches, but that's because these turbo pads were a later innovation. However, they were standard on all turbo graphics and core graphics models and so here they are. The turbo pads are a fantastic addition because they let you do some pretty remarkable stuff if you play around with them. Setting the turbo switches on while playing Bonk can even make you fly across the screen. And have you ever seen R-Type played like this? Remember, if you beat a turbo graphics game using the turbo switches, by no means did you actually beat it. You freaking obliterated it! You dominated it! But you most certainly didn't beat it. The difference? A beating implies they were actually survivors. Let's go ahead and switch this thing on. First off, you're greeted with the following menu. You'd think that a product sent from Japan would be difficult to get through at this juncture, but it's not a problem with the TurboGrafx Mini. Even the box and manual are completely in English. Just choose English from this menu, and you're good to go. The menu screens are absolutely crisp to perfection. Just as with the Sega Genesis Mini, this whole thing was designed by M2, and they've actually outdone themselves here. For starters, the box art for the games are big, beautiful, and most importantly, accurate. With the only exception being New Adventure Island, where they, for whatever reason, did not include the original box art. Scrolling through the games feels perfectly responsive as well. I always like to stop and admire Dungeon Explorer. It looks like an expressionist painting that you'd find in a pretentious art museum. It's fabulous. Anyway, let's just keep scrolling. At the bottom of each game is a nifty little graphic that both tells you if you have used save spots for the game and the number of players the game can support. Bonk's Revenge here is, of course, a one-player game, and scrolling one over, we see that Kadash not only has two save states occupied, but that the game supports up to two players. A neat detail worth noting here is just how the save states are indicated here. If you look back at Bonk, you'll notice that you have four little TurboGrafx-16s missing their backing. But if you switch over to Kadash again, you see that the two are shown attached to the Turbo Booster Plus. That's because the Turbo Booster Plus allowed players to save their games. That's a freaking awesome detail. Also, check this out. So you see Kadash here has two players because it has two controllers. But if you scroll on over to Bomberman 93, and what do you see? The Roman numeral 5, meaning this game is up to five players, which is fantastic. However, the catch is that you will also need to buy the turbo tap accessory and four more controllers by Hori. Doing so would cost more than $130, so as cool as this option is, it's probably not for everybody. And it should be noted that there are only a few games that make good on this feature. Dungeon Explorer and two Bomberman games. It can also be used for Motor Rotor, Super Momtaro Densetsu 2, and Apare Gateball. But you'll see later why these last three games don't really matter. You've probably also noticed by now the Turbo Graphics theme going on here. You have a black Turbo Graphics runner at the top of the screen with a turbo chip slot, and then you have the classic neon yellow, black, and orange color schemes. It looks very classy. Down here at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a handy little set of menu choices that are easily accessed by simply pressing down on the control pad. As you can see, here are the settings. I press button one to access that, and we see that the first item says manual. Let's just take a quick look here and you get a link to a PDF of the same manual that comes in the box. It's kind of pointless. So going back, you see that we have an option to change the language anytime you like. And then there's the display settings, which are interesting. Let's click on that. So you get five different ways to stretch pixels across your modern widescreen TV. If you want a technical breakdown of what these are in terms of actual pixel resolutions and their specific effects on gameplay, then I highly recommend my Life in Gaming's recent and excellent review of the PC Engine Mini. Links in the description. For our purposes, I'll just show you how each choice looks on my favorite TurboGrafx-16 game, Ninja Spirit. Let's just go with the default display settings for now. Now let's just boot up Ninja Spirit here. And check this out. You get a transition screen showing a turbo chip being loaded onto the system. How awesome is that? There's actually a separate animation for all of the different types of PC Engine games, including an animation of CD games booting up with the spinning CD-ROM drive. The attention to detail here is simply astonishing. Anyway, so Ninja Spirit is starting, and wait. Do you see this default border around the screen? I think that's really distracting, so I'm gonna press and hold select and run at the same time. 
and you get this screen which gives me the option to save my game in one of four save slot locations, load a save state if I have one, or return to the main menu. I'm going to return to the main menu, and I'm going back into the settings down here to wallpapers. You get four choices, and I personally only like one of them, all black. Okay, now I'm ready to go back to Ninja Spirit. So I boot the game up one more time, and now there's no distracting borders. So, as you can see, this is the default screen resolution, and from what I understand, it's best for most games on here, but not necessarily all. So far, I always just keep it at this resolution, and as you can see, Ninja Spirit looks very good. Let's compare the default screen setting to setting number two, which slightly stretches the screen in all four directions, filling out the top and bottom of the screen. And here's how Ninja Spirit looks in this mode by itself. Pretty good, but I still prefer option one. Here are both options, side by side. Now let's select option three, which narrows the screen down quite a bit. And honestly, this option looks surprisingly good too. The sprites look really crisp, and my Ninja Warrior guy here is also quite a bit leaner and taller. And who doesn't want to be tall and lean? This might be a really good option for sprites looking to get out there and meet somebody, you know what I mean? Here's option three, side by side with the default setting. Now let's look at option four. This is the option that always makes Retro Purists the most mad. Full screen mode! which of course stretches the image out into freakish proportions. This is basically the opposite of option three, and boy, holy cow, as predicted, this looks terrible. Just look at the little dog. He's like a little white blob now. And now all the ninjas in the game are short and fat. This is basically Danny DeVito mode. Here's option four compared to the default setting. Finally, we have something completely badass, and yet unnecessary. Turbo Express Mode. If you don't know, NEC put out one of the first full-fledged handheld video game consoles on the market in 1990. It was a portable TurboGrafx-16, and it was way ahead of its time. It was also $250, and it had a tiny, ultra-low resolution LCD screen that was guaranteed to give you eye strain. And it sucked down AA batteries like a vampire at a blood bank. But here it is as an optional overlay in the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. So, let's try it out. And it's awesome. And it makes my eyes burn. But the fact that someone at M2 decided to make this an option is simply amazing. Once again, I love it. One more display feature worth mentioning is the ability to add the CRT-like scan lines. In case you hate looking at crisp, clean images on your modern television screen. You just pick any screen resolution that you like, and then press the run button. The little CRT in the corner indicates that the CRT filter is now on, and let's just see how this looks. And honestly, in my opinion, it looks kind of like crap. This is a neat feature, and it gives my kids an idea of what it was really like back in the day. But I don't really think CRTs look this bad. The colors are too dark, and everything looks washed out. This isn't how I'm going to play. A couple more settings to talk about are the menu designs, the credits, and the restore factory settings. First off is the menu design, which only pertains to the PC Engine side of things, which we'll get to in a minute. But basically all it does is allow you to change the PC Engine menu color scheme from white and red to black and blue. But I like the PC Engine menu settings, so I'm just going to keep it right there. Then there are the credits, and it's exactly what you think. It's credits. Finally, there's the option to restore factory settings which sets everything back to default and eliminates all of your save states. A feature I love is the fact that it's very hard to do this accidentally. You have to tap, and then tap again, and then keep tapping on that control pad until you fill up the bar to actually reset everything. Or, you could just use the turbo feature. Yeah! And even then, you're given a confirmation prompt allowing you to abort the process. Now that's attention to detail. This is boring, what about the games? I was just getting to that, because there's a lot to say. 
The TurboGrafx Mini's included game library is very odd. First off, it's one of the biggest, with 57 games. However, the game library is split into two separate categories. TurboGrafx-16 games that were released in the US, and PC Engine games from Japan. To start with, we have our TurboGrafx-16 collection, as we've already seen. But to switch over to the PC Engine side, all you have to do is push down and move the cursor over to where it says PC Engine. Hit it, and you get a cool transition screen that makes it look like you've switched over to something completely different. You get different music, a different look, and best of all, you get all of this gorgeous Japanese box art. The Japanese box art was so much better. Except Dungeon Explorer. Why does Dungeon Explorer always get the worst box art? I have to tell you, at first, I didn't like the concept of the 57 games being split between two separate menus. I tend to like all of my onions in one basket, you know? But on the other hand, having 57 different games all in rotation like this would also be very cumbersome to scroll through. Even with the option down here to change the game order from alphabetical to release date or by game format. Having the games lumped into two separate smaller sets is actually, practically speaking, a pretty good idea. Thumbs up to M2 on that. The only downside is that you have to constantly remember if the game you want to play is on one menu or the other. For instance, I keep forgetting that Bonk's Adventure isn't on the US side, but is rather here on the Japanese side as PC Genjin. And then it gets weird because on the Japanese side we also have Dungeon Explorer. So remember Dungeon Explorer? You probably recall that it was also on the TurboGrafx-16 side, because who can forget box art like that? So yes, as most of you probably know by now, another weird thing about the TurboGrafx Mini was, was that not only did they divide the game library into North American and Japanese categories, but they also opted to include duplicates within both of those categories. Which means that while technically there are a total of 57 games on board, only 52 are actually unique. Newtopia 1, Newtopia 2, Military Madness, Dungeon Explorer, and Ease Books 1 and 2 are available in both Japanese or English. Compounding this weirdness was the decision to include Japanese games that require you to actually speak Japanese in order to play them. Super Momotaro Densetsu 2, Jaseiken Necromancer, and most sadly of all, Snatcher, are only going to be playable for people who are fairly good at reading and speaking Japanese. Further, I'd add Apare Gateball to this category since it has a ton of Japanese menus, and is also a bafflingly awful croquet simulator that probably very few people are ever going to want to play. That brings the functional game library down even further to about 48 games, practically speaking. Which still makes it one of the largest of any mini console. But this also makes it one of the most confusing to navigate by far. Where's Bonk's Adventure again? Did they leave it in Japan? Why is it in Japan? And who the heck is PC Genjin? Another odd and yet extremely welcome aspect of the TurboGrafx-16 Mini's game library is the inclusion of CD, Super CD, and even a couple of Super Graphics games. For instance, on the TurboGrafx side of things, you can play Ease Books 1 and 2, which was made for the original Turbo CD, a $400 CD player add-on that only the most hardened of hardcore gamers ever owned. That's pretty amazing, but even more amazing is the inclusion of Lords of Thunder, which is a so-called Super CD game that, that required you to either own a Turbo Duo or purchase a separate RAM expansion card for your TurboGrafx CD setup. Switching back over to the PC Engine, there are actually a lot more CD and Super CD games included. They even included the highly collectible Ginga Fuke Densetsu Sapphire, a very late CD title that required yet another expansion card called the Arcade Card. All these games requiring all these additional pieces of hardware and RAM cards almost makes the TurboGrafx Mini feel like it includes games from multiple systems under one roof. Oh wait, these are two games for the Super Graphics, which really was a completely different system, a failed successor to the PC Engine that never went anywhere. In fact, you're looking at roughly 50% of that system's entire game library. Whoa. Right, so it turns out the TurboGrafx-16 Mini is really strange. It seems like it's not really a TurboGrafx-16 Mini at all. It's practically more of an NEC Hudson Soft Mini. It has a collection of games across multiple platforms that represents a unique period of time in which Hudson and NEC were still viable contenders in the home video game market. So it's actually like a Turbo PC Engine Super CD Arcade Graphics Mini. Or you could just call it a Turbo Duo Mini with the arcade card. 
I mean, it's kind of weird that less than half of the games on here are actually technically TurboGrafx-16 games. That's amazing. It's like if Nintendo released the NES Classic, but there were over 50 games, and 60% of the games were actually from the Super Nintendo and the Game Boy. Imagine how awesome that would have been. That's basically what we're dealing with here. And I can't say I'm complaining. So what about those 48 functionally unique games? How good are they? Let's start with the PC Engine side of things. The good news is that with the exception of the aforementioned games, the other included PC Engine games offer little to no trouble for non-Japanese speakers. Let's just boot up Salamander here, which by the way is a game that's completely unique to the Turbo Graphics and Core Graphics Mini. Let me pause real quick and I'd like to point out that there's almost no difference between the PC Engine Mini's game library and this, except that the PC Engine Mini didn't get Salamander, which is a real shame. Also, the PC Engine Mini has two additional games, Far East of Eden 2, a JRPG that wouldn't be playable for most of us anyway, and a dating sim that's also completely inaccessible to non-Japanese speakers. The only other minor differences is that the TurboGrafx Mini has the US version of Splatterhouse, which is sadly the censored version, whereas the PC Engine Mini retains the unaltered Japanese version. Okay, so anyway, here's Salamander, and as you can see, I easily start the game up can play it and interpret its simple text without being able to read or speak Japanese. And like I said, almost all of the games in here fall into this category. And there's a good reason for this high level of accessibility. 14 of the included PC Engine games are all shooters. If you omit the redundant games and the games that require knowledge of Japanese, then that means 60% of all of the included PC Engine games are shooters. And shooters, being what they are, don't typically require a lot of text, instructions, or backstory. You just move around, and you blow stuff up. That's like a universal language, dude. And this brings me to the very last odd fact about the TurboGrafx-16 Mini's game library. If you count Space Harrier 2, then this thing has over 21 shooters on it. That's remarkable. There are more shooters on this thing than the NES Classic, Sega Genesis Classic, SNES Classic, and Neo Geo Classic, combined. It's a shmup lover's paradise. Standout titles include Blazing Lasers, the American version of R-Type, which is the complete version, Air Zonk, Soldier Blade, we already mentioned Lords of Thunder, Fantasy Zone, which is a Sega game, that's pretty badass, Space Harrier, which is also a Sega game, though both of these were ported by NEC, Sapphire, Two different Spriggan games, and then there is the beloved classic Gradius and its sequel. That's only about half of the shooters that are on here. The point is, there are a ton of fantastic shooters on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. If you're into old school retro shooters, then this thing was practically made for you. However. The heavy emphasis on shooters means that other popular genres have sort of taken a hit here. I mean, if you have room for 48 functionally unique games, but 21 of them are all shooters, then that doesn't give you a ton of room for the other big game genres from the 90s. But it still gives you room for at least 27, and that's still not too shabby. Do you love JRPGs? Well, the Turbo Graphics Mini does have Ease Books 1 and 2, which is widely regarded as a classic of the genre. And when I say classic, I mean it, because this is actually a compilation of two different games that were originally made for Japanese home computers way back in 1987. The first game, Ease 1, originally came out a year after Dragon Quest. It came out about six months before the original Fantasy Star, making Ease not just an old JRPG, but among the very first to ever exist. As a unique piece of video game history, with stellar music I might add, it's a game that I highly recommend. However, that being said, I also have to admit its many shortcomings, including poorly developed storytelling and characters, primitive graphics, and a truncated length and lack of complexity. Also, there's the game's infamous bump mechanics, wherein you fight monsters by simply bumping into them. Imagine playing The Legend of Zelda, but instead of getting to swing your sword, you just walk into a bunch of enemies until either they die, or they drain too much of your health and you have to run away. That, like, kinda sucks. 
If you're looking for a rich, text-heavy adventure akin to Final Fantasy or Fantasy Star, then you're probably going to be disappointed in this. It's not that kind of game. And it's the only real RPG included here that's in English. Okay, well then what about fighting games? There aren't any. Not even one. Alright then, well what about beat-em-ups? Didn't they have a port of Double Dragon 2? That's like my favorite game, dog. Sadly, Double Dragon 2 is not on here, but there are three other games that can sort of be construed as beat-em-ups if you squint under just the right light. On the PC Engine side, there's The Kung Fu, which we knew as China Warrior over here in the US. This is a frequently maligned upgrade to Irem's Kung Fu, featuring massive screen-filling sprites that were extremely impressive in 1987. In 1987. Today, to most people, this game looks and plays ridiculous with its choppy animation and unbelievably stupid enemy encounters with things like rocks, butterflies, sticks, more rocks, and Trappist monks who are just trying to live a life of beer making and quiet contemplation until Bruce Lee comes along and just decides to wreck them. But honestly, this game actually plays pretty good and has some awesome music. It is far from awful, but it's also far from what anyone would call good. I'll say, this looks terrible! Okay, well there's also Genpai Tomaden by Namco. Check this out. Alright, let's just forget that and take a look at the TurboGrafx-16 side of things because this bad boy's got Splatterhouse! Splatterhouse is a horror-themed arcade beat-em-up from 1988 that allows you to play as Jason Voorhees on a mission to save his girlfriend from horrible mutants and monsters. Except this is the US version where you get a purple hockey mask and there's some censorship of religious imagery. But the game still plays great with simple fighting mechanics and creative levels with spooky atmosphere that's guaranteed to scare away your little sister. This is one of the mandatory titles for the TurboGrafx-16, and frankly, I love it. Alright, so there's a ton of good shooters, no fighting games, one crusty old RPG, and one good beat-em-up? Basically. But I still wouldn't call Ease crusty. It's more like vintage. Okay dude, then what about sports games? Well, we got Offity Gate Ball and Power Golf. So, no sports games then? No, not really. But, at the same time, you shouldn't be too quick to dismiss Power Golf. It was developed by Hudson Soft themselves and features up to three player competitive gameplay across 18 different. Wait, it's a golf game, right? Well, yeah. Then who cares? What about racers? Racing games, I'm glad you asked, because on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, there's no less than two. First, there's Victory Run, a neat cross-country racer intended to recreate the experience of the Paris-Dakar Rally, a real-life cross-country motor race that starts in Paris, France, and ends up on the beaches of Dakar, Senegal. The scrolling graphics are remarkably smooth considering the hardware it was designed for, and it's got an even smoother soundtrack. The only problem is that the game places a heavy and some might say too heavy emphasis on resource management, making progression an exercise in blind guessing and frustration. And then there's Motor Rotor. Well, it's got five player co op if you buy the $30 Turbo Tap and four extra controllers. There is no fighting games, no sports games, one beat em up, and one decent racer, and an old RPG. Is there anything other than shooters on this thing? Does it even have one decent platformer? Oh, heck yeah! The Turbo Graphics Mini may not have a very even distribution across the most popular video game genres from the 80s and 90s, but it does have a ton of badass side scrolling platformers. First and foremost among these are the Bonk games, 
On the PC Engine side of things, there's PC Genjin, the original PC Engine mascot game. And personally, I find this game to be every bit as fun as Sonic or the Mario games from the same time period. PC Genjin, in case you were wondering, is in fact exactly the same game as Bonk's Adventure on the TurboGrafx-16. But the character name was originally PC Genjin, which basically translates to caveman in Japanese. It's a cute play on words. PC Engine? PC Genjin? Get it? Over on the Turbo Graphics side is the popular sequel, Bonk's Revenge, which is really just more of the same. But that's not a bad thing, because the original Bonk game was great. But there are other great mascot style platformers on here as well. There's JJ and Jeff, an extremely difficult but fun game with a zany sense of humor and lots of wacky secrets. There's a solid remake of the original Wonder Boy and Adventure Island game called New Adventure Island. It's colorful, fast paced, and a lot of fun. Best of all, there's Parasol Stars, the third entry in Taito's Bubble Bobble series which features two player simultaneous co-op. It was also an early publication by the defunct but much beloved working designs. So you know this game is grade A nerd approved. I certainly like it. But wait, want something with a little more edge than all these kitty games? The Turbo Graphics has you covered. You get Kadash, another early US publication by Working Designs that combines the best elements of a D&D style dungeon crawler with side scrolling hack and slash action. In this game, bats are your biggest enemy, just like in real life. Then there's Capcom's beloved arcade platformer Ghouls and Ghosts for the Super Graphics. This is an incredible port that's even closer to being arcade perfect than the Sega Genesis version. Speaking of ports, did you know that the PC Engine had a graphically upgraded port of Ninja Gaiden that had scrolling backgrounds that actually move in the wrong direction? A lot of people harp on this game, but I think it's really no worse than the original. And if you love those cheesy cutscenes, then you need to know that there's a code that makes all the text into English. But then there it is. The granddaddy of them all. The best game, in one of the best franchises of all time. Castlevania Dracula X. This is a brutally difficult, yet highly satisfying entry in the classic series with branching paths to explore, copious secrets, and even a hidden playable character that sort of acts as the game's easy mode. The graphics and sound are easily among the best of any game ever made for the PC Engine. Once upon a time, this was by far the most coveted and yet elusive game on the platform, because it was sadly never released in the US and required both the Turbo CD and the Super CD expansion card in order to be played. If you missed out on the original release, or the PSP remake, or the re-release on the PS4, then here is yet another chance to play one of the greatest games of all time. Real quick, I just have to point out something completely awesome about booting this game up on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Check this out. This thing is chock full of neat little touches and secrets, and one of the coolest is the fact that they've included boot up error screens for many of the CD based games. Back in the day, if you tried to play a CD game without the correct system card, you'd get an error message. Sometimes that error message would be something interesting, as a kind of fun easter egg, but one of the best ever happened to be for Castlevania Dracula X. If you boot up the game normally on the menu screen, you get an animation showing the Super System card going into the Hue card slot, followed by a spinning PC Engine CD, and then the Super CD-ROM boot up screen that prompts you to press Run. Then the game just starts normally. However, if at the menu screen you hold down the Select button while pressing Run, you get a similar series of animations showing the insertion of the regular PC Engine CD card version 2.0, which is the incorrect system card. This triggers the original error screen from Castlevania Dracula X, only it's not just an error screen, but it's actually a tiny playable game featuring cute toy-like versions of the game's main characters in a 3D rendered world. At the end of this tiny level you get a message telling you to insert the correct system card in order to play the real game, in Japanese. This is the kind of touch that normally only exists on real hardware, but here it is, in defiance of expectations. Okay, I had to share that. Alright, back to the review. So while the Turbo Graphics Mini might be lacking in a few genres, it's got a ton of great entries in the single most important retro gaming category, which is of course, side-scrolling platformers. 
But at the same time, it's not like we're just limited to the most popular game genres here. There are other less popular genres that are represented with excellent games. The most obvious of which is probably the Bomberman series, which is practically a genre unto itself. The TurboGrafx Mini comes with both Bomberman 93 and its excellent sequel, Bomberman 94. These simple maze-like action games are for many retro gamers among the very best of all time. I personally happen to agree. And unlike Motor Rotor, they provide a fantastic reason to get a TurboTap and four extra controllers. If you've never played Bomberman with three or more people, then you've really been missing out. And that's not all. The Turbo Graphics actually has a ton of great games across many of the lesser known genres, including Alien Crush, a pinball sim widely regarded as one of the greatest ever made. Military Madness, an influential strategy game that was one of the first of its kind. Newtopia 1 and 2, an action RPG series in the vein of the original Zelda. Legend of Valkyrie, an amazing overhead running gun that also pays homage to Zelda. And Bomberman Panic, a competitive Tetris-like game based on the Bomberman series. So yeah, this mini console is definitely geared towards fans of the shooting genre. But overall, the library is still huge, and it contains a lot of excellent games across a wide variety of different genres. Whoa, man, but where's Legendary Axe or Bloody Wolf? And how could they omit Gate of Thunder? There's 21 shooters on here and they couldn't put Gate of Thunder? Yes, sadly, the game library included is not what I'd consider complete. And there are some very important TurboGrafx-16 games that I think they really should have included. But that's always the case with these mini consoles. Still, overall, what is included is very good. And if you're a fan of retro shooters, then I think I have to call this thing a must-have. But what about the quality of the emulation, dude? Do the games actually work right? The short answer? Absolutely. But there are a few issues that we really need to talk about. I am not a super tech-savvy guy, and to me, these games all play perfectly fine. I don't notice any slowdown, screen tearing, input delays, sound delays, artifacts, or anything at all that would make these games unplayable or somehow intrinsically worse than if you played them off real hardware. However, the emulation here is not 100% perfect, as if that was even possible. A lot of people have been talking about the shimmering effect on some of the games. A lot of the games, actually. Once again, I just don't see it very clearly, but then I don't have very good eyesight to begin with. However, the one game that really stood out to me in this regard was R-Type. No matter which screen resolution I chose from the main menu, I still keep noticing a very obvious shimmering effect while playing the game. You might be asking yourself, what is shimmering? Well, see these pixels wobbling all over the place here like they're alive or something? Those aren't supposed to do that, and it's because the original R-Type game was made at a pixel resolution that, that doesn't quite match any of the options available here. And while it's definitely noticeable, it doesn't really ruin the game for me. Other flaws that have been widely talked about include an alleged 3 to 5 frame sound delay out of a total of 60 frames and also an input delay for some other games. Again, I have playtested this thing extensively at this point, and I have not been able to discern either of these problems. And honestly, I'm a little skeptical of this kind of criticism. I think perhaps these kinds of technical quibbles come less from a sincere concern for perfect emulation and play experience, but more from a need to defend the purchase and use of expensive original hardware at all costs. I'm starting to get the feeling that for certain purists, no emulation, no matter how close to perfect, will ever be perfect enough. In my untrained opinion, as a person who just likes to play video games without running them all through an oscilloscope, the emulation here is more than good enough. It sounds good, it looks good, and in my opinion, it plays perfectly. However, if you went to MIT and in your spare time you assembled your own RGB monitor to play Beyond Shadowgate on the original Turbo Duo you got back in 1993, the one you personally replaced all the transistors in yourself, then the Turbo Graphics Mini is probably not for you anyway. You already have more than three times as many games in their original boxes lining the shelves somewhere in your video game museum house. You don't need this. And it's four out of 60 frame per second sound delay. It's just gonna piss you off. But as for me and probably most of us, this emulation is just as good as anything out there. It's not perfect, but of course not. Nothing on this earth really is. But there is another flaw with this thing that we really need to talk about. The cost. 
We paid $110 to import this bad boy from Japan, making it by far the most expensive retro mini console I have ever purchased. The Super Nintendo Classic was also a relatively hefty $80 console, but that unit came with two high quality controllers in the box. With the TurboGrafx Mini you only get one high quality controller. Even the $100 PlayStation Classic came with two controllers. What gives? How could this be more expensive than the PlayStation Classic? Wait, don't forget about the accessories. The unit doesn't come with an AC adapter, which isn't necessary, but a lot of people will still want one. And then there are all the games that support three or more players. To play those games as they're intended, you're going to want to purchase the $30 TurboTap by Hori and extra controllers. If you were to get four extra controllers to make your Bomberman dreams come true, then you'd have to pay somewhere between $230 and $250. You could almost get a real console for that! True, and even if you're not interested in 5 player Bomberman or 5 player Dungeon Explorer, you're still probably going to want to get a second controller to play all the 2 player games. That puts this thing about $125 minimum, and that's pretty crazy. On the other hand, for many people, this is still probably the single best way that they're ever going to play or replay these classic games. A lot of people are opposed to downloading ROMs from sketchy websites, and collecting real hardware is extraordinarily expensive, cumbersome, and time consuming. A working Turbo Duo, which combines the Turbo Graphics and Turbo CD into a single unit, can cost between $300 and $400. Getting a proper working monitor setup is also becoming more expensive and is a cumbersome task for people who aren't devoted to retro gaming full time. Then there's the cost of the games. Turbo graphics and PC Engine games are often very expensive on the collector's market. Soldier Blade here goes for hundreds of dollars. So does Castlevania. Sapphire can cost over a thousand dollars. The game library included on the TurboGrafx Mini would potentially cost tens of thousands of dollars in the form of authentic hardware and original software. So even though the retail price for the TurboGrafx Mini is high, too high even, it's still actually a good deal for non-collectors who also want to experience nostalgia or enrich their understanding of gaming's golden age from the mid 80s to the mid 90s. There's no doubt in my mind that the TurboGrafx-16 itself represents the greatest and truest of gaming's so-called hidden gems, and the TurboGrafx Mini does that legacy justice. Do we recommend the TurboGrafx Mini? Yes, enthusiastically we recommend the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, even at the current retail price. The TurboGrafx Mini is a beautifully constructed, accurate representation of one of the greatest game consoles of the 90s. Some may balk at the size, but we feel that the large size perfectly encapsulates the spirit of the original design. It comes with 48 functionally distinct games, most of which range from good to great, and if you're a fan of old school shooters, the quality and breadth of this particular game library is simply too good to be missed. Also, M2's incredible attention to detail shines through at every level, offering not only what is by far the best menu interface of any retro console on the market to date, but more easter eggs and hidden touches than I can even cram into this massive review. I still haven't even mentioned the fact that this thing comes with 5-6 to six secret games depending on how you count them. Well it does! SURPRISE! Using a simple input code you can also play so called near arcade versions of Fantasy Zone, Gradius, and Salamander. All three of which are simply astonishing additions for hardcore shooting fans. Also included are two fun mini games that were also on the PC Engine Mini, Twin B Returns and Force Gear. For all of this, in spite of its few shortcomings, we are forced to give the TurboGrafx-16 Mini our highest recommendation. 5 out of 5! If you have ever wanted to experience the TurboGrafx-16 or the PC Engine, but you are reluctant to do so because of the high cost of collecting, then this mini console is definitely for you. And if you're a fan of Wetzel Suda's, this is definitely a must-have for you. If, however, you already own these games on original hardware, then this is probably not for you. But for our family, it's been a huge hit, and we've been playing every day. And for me, personally, because of its history, because of its scope and attention to detail, I have to crown this as my new favorite of all the retro mini consoles that have come before it. It's fantastic. So, have any of you been playing the TurboGrafx-16 Mini since it came out in Japan? Let us know what you think about it in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching, we really appreciate it.
Bye now.